The story of Lincoln begins, ironically enough, with the founder of Cadillac, Henry Leyland. Leyland's passion was to construct an automobile that would deliver the occupants from the harsh realities of the early 20th century. The basic horseless carriage would never be the same. Leyland's Cadillac automobiles played a role in the genesis of a transportation revolution. In 1917, Leyland left Cadillac to give birth to a new automobile. He chose to name it in honor of the first president he had ever voted for, Abraham Lincoln. The First World War would wreak havoc on Lincoln, and the company was sold to Ford Motor Company in 1922. Henry Ford had little interest in anything more than basic transportation, but his son Edsel had a different vision. Edsel would bravely forge his own way and set a path for Lincoln to become something much more than basic transportation. One of the earliest Lincoln innovations was the Zephyr and its V12 engine. It was dubbed the car of the future. Its flowing lines and ornate details were a world away from the pedestrian Ford products of Henry Ford. And through the years, Lincolns would continue to exude a class and sophistication that elevated them well above their Ford and Mercury brethren. Though rarely as popular as its distant relative Cadillac, Lincoln was a true contender in the American luxury field. From the country club to the most sophisticated social events, Lincoln automobiles represented the finest in taste and refinement. And by the mid-60s, Lincoln had evolved into one of the most elegant automotive shapes of all time. Interiors were just as elegant as the exteriors and featured amenities and details that rivaled the finest offerings from Europe. The 1970s Lincolns were even larger, yet just as luxurious, though some would argue they had lost some of the elegance of the previous generations. Much of this sentiment can be attributed to the contemporary preferences of the 70s consumer. Crushed velour and ornate details don't exactly resonate with modern mainstream tastes. Regardless, the era of unbridled American automotive opulence was nearing its twilight. The shooting stopped. A delicate equilibrium was restored. But the Arabs made an economic power play. As punishment for this country's support of Israel, 11 Arab countries cut off all oil shipments to the United States. We are heading toward the most acute shortages of energy since World War II. American automobile manufacturers of the time were slow to evolve, but Lee Iacocca had seen the writing on the wall, and he convinced Ford to add luxury features to its compact offerings, such as the Granada. As with the Mustang, and particularly the Mustang II, 
Ayacoca would distill value into a smaller package with the Granada, which was an evolution of the Maverick, which itself was an evolution of the ancient Falcon. Ayacoca pushed for ornate exterior and interior styling, which in upscale Ghia trim rivaled the finest offerings of the time, at least in appearance. Cadillac one upped Ford and Chrysler with the 1976 Seville, which offered Cadillac levels of luxury in a drastically downsized form. The Seville was based on GM's K platform, which itself was derived from the fourth generation X platform. The transformation from what was essentially a Chevy Nova to a truly luxurious and modern automobile was one of the rare automotive triumphs of the 70s. Interiors featured genuine leather and sophisticated electronics. Exteriors ditched the rounded X-body lines for a crisp, tailored look which obscured the drastically downsized dimensions. Ford scrambled to produce an answer to the surprisingly popular and well-received Seville. Fortunately for Ford, America had set its sights on the past as a distraction from the stark realities of the 1970s. And the American automobile would undergo a transformation unlike anything seen before or since. Ornate detail and opulence would distract from such realities as power-snapping emissions controls and crippling energy shortages. This generation of automobile would be labeled Baroque. and the Palace of Versailles represented everything that was Baroque. Both Ford and Mercury products were an early adopter of the Baroque style, with ornate hood ornaments and gilded headlight and body trim. From padded vinyl headlamp doors with intricate ornamentation, to wheel trim that could double as dinnerware for royalty, Baroque styling was a distraction from a grim era. Offerings from other automakers, such as the Chrysler Cordoba, also proved very successful after adopting the Baroque aesthetic. But once again, our tribal Cadillac may have started it all, with its Baroque-themed literature of the late 60s. The Lincoln Versailles was introduced in 1977. Efforts were made to try to differentiate it from its lesser Granada and Monarch origins. Brochures focused on the many standard luxury options and features such as clear coat paint and powertrain parts that were balanced and paired together to minimize vibration and harshness. As with many Ford products of the time, a wide array of interior and exterior colors and options meant that having a relatively unique Versailles was entirely possible. Initially, the 351 Windsor V8 was standard in most states, while the 302 was standard in California and high altitude areas. The 302 was optional for those who preferred its slightly better fuel economy. Shortly after Versailles' introduction, the 351 was dropped and the 302 was made standard along with the familiar and durable SelectShift 3-speed transmission. Initially, the Versailles seemed like a guaranteed hit, with its handsome front-end styling and handful of innovations. Ford's marketing department made every effort to position its downsized luxury offering as something worthy of its sophisticated moniker. Opera lights, a Rolls-Royce style grille, and padded vinyl details attempted to convince buyers this really was a car worthy of a price tag that was actually higher than other Lincoln offerings of the time. Mm -hmm. 
Marketing literature continued to attempt to make a connection between the Versailles and Lincoln's more traditional continental lineup. And it is true that interiors featured the same high-gloss wood tone accents and genuine leather detailing. And in some ways, the Versailles actually outclassed Lincoln's more traditional offerings with cutting-edge innovations such as clear coat paint and halogen headlamps. But sales never took off, as many saw the Versailles as nothing more than a Granada in disguise. It became clear from early on, no matter the marketing hype, Versailles would never escape the shadow of its humble origins. When the initial Baroque-style marketing failed, Ford turned to the popular space aesthetic of the era in an attempt to enhance the appeal of the fledgling Versailles. Though there were few changes for its sophomore year, effort was made to convince potential buyers that the Versailles offered technology and quality to justify its premium over lesser siblings. For model year 1978, marketing literature focused on the technology and electronics that set the Versailles apart from its rivals. And of course, there was, as always, a focus on Lincoln hallmarks, such as the Cartier sign digital clock, lighted vanity mirrors, and deeply upholstered seats that would embarrass even the most plush 70s lounges. Advanced for the time, four-wheel disc brakes and electronic engine and vehicle systems monitoring were standard. Plush leather seats, electronic climate control, and even an optional integrated garage door opener were available. The simple front-engine, rear-solid axle layout, while traditional, did offer easy service and durability. The unique clear coat finish was a first for a mass-produced American automobile and offered a luster that was virtually unrivaled. Simulated spoke wheel finishings, numerous appearance and convenience options, and a continental kit-style deck load attempted to connect the Little Versailles to Lincoln's legendary heritage. For 1979, the theme was early 20th century glamour, which reflected another popular aesthetic trend of the era. Visually, the biggest change was a more formal upright rear roof line that should have been part of the design from the beginning to better differentiate Versailles from Granada and Monarch. Rich Dorchester cloth upholstery is seen here in Champagne, 
with flight bench configuration was a popular selection. Other color options included duff gray, turquoise, wedgewood blue, dark red, and cordovan. And of course, rich supple leather was always on offer. As with so many American offerings of the past, as Versailles neared its twilight, it finally was receiving the features and detailing that could have made it successful, if offered at inception. For its final year, there was again little change for the short-lived Versailles. In only a few short years, Versailles had traveled from centuries past to the distant future, and landed somewhere in between. Few would argue Versailles was a great car, but rather a product of its time. There was great turmoil, uncertainty, and no one really knew what the future would hold. We look back at the cars of this era as a comforting reminder of the past we have lived. There were dark times, yet here we are. We did survive. And of course, there is always what we aspire to be and to achieve. These sketches were graciously provided to this channel by former designer Dick Nesbitt. The graceful lines he rendered so many years ago provide a glimpse of the inspiration that went into the Versailles project. Versailles was an attempt to bring Lincoln's rich heritage to a new reality and help ensure its future. And now we can only hope that our future holds tranquility, peace, and the return of those glorious fender blades. <laughs>